Okay, so just recording has started, just letting you know. Um, so before we start, I would like to go over a few housekeeping points. Um, can everyone please double check that their microphones are muted? This will allow everyone to hear the presenters clearly. We would love to hear your questions. So if, um, so if you um, have any questions throughout the webinar, please um, pop them down in the Q&A box below and we will go through them at the end of the presentation. If you have more than one person in the room today listening in, um, just we would appreciate if you could please um, send us a quick private message via the chat tab to let us know how many people are listening in with you. If you face any technical issues during the presentation, please write them in the chat box and we will do our best to help you. I have Joe helping me today. Um, and also this webinar is recorded. Um, so if you want to keep your um, video turned off or um, you feel free to do that. Today's webinar, um, just a quick overview of what we're going to cover. Uh, we're going to look at the risk factors that cause heat injury among young children. We're also going to be looking at the prevention and management strategies to heat illness, um, as well as the services out there that raise awareness of heat injury and fire risk in WA. <laughs> So a bit about Injury Matters, we are for safer people and places. Injury Matters aims to prevent and reduce the impact of injury within the Western Australian community. We do this through advocating and providing education for injury prevention, as well as providing support for people who have been impacted by injury. Today's webinar is delivered by our No Injury Program with, a department, with the support of the Department of Health, WA. No Injury is a statewide program which aims to enhance the capacity of injury prevention and safety promotion practitioners to deliver quality injury prevention activities. Via the No Injury program, we provide training events, resources and networking opportunities to support injury prevention across the sector. Given the diversity of injury in WA, the program involves a variety of injury topics. However, today we are going to focus on the topic of heat injury among young children. So a bit about the context. In the hot weather, taking care of one's health is vital. WA can experience log per long periods of extreme heat where the maximum temperatures are much hotter than usual. Some people are more vulnerable in the hot weather and need to take extra care of their health to prevent heat related illnesses such as heat stress and heat stroke. Some of the key vulnerable populations to be particularly mindful of are babies and young children, teenagers, pregnant women, older people, people with existing physical or mental conditions, or people who are on certain medications, as well as people exercising in the heat. The latest Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or the IPCC report, um, revealed Australia has already warmed 1.4 degrees Celsius which is much higher than the global average of 1.1 degrees Celsius. Australian children are at a higher, at a greater risk of inheriting a dangerous climate, which will see more fires, floods, droughts, and extreme temperatures. The IPCC report projects that in the coming decades, climate change will increase in all regions. For 1.5 degrees Celsius of global warming, there will be increased heat waves, longer, warm seasons and shorter cold seasons. Not every country or region is warming at the same rate though, with young children being one of the most vulnerable groups to heat related injury, especially during the summer months of Western Australia, where temperatures can reach up to 45 degrees Celsius. This is of particular concern. And health professionals working with young children need to have injury prevention strategies to pl in place to help address heat related injury. To talk more about this and the different risk factors to consider when working with young children during the summer months, I would like to welcome our first speaker for today, Kristen Jameson from Kids Safe WA. Kristen is a senior project officer looking after a range of programs that Kids Safe WA provide. Please welcome Kristen. Thanks, Abu. I'm just going to share my screen. I'll just give you one minute. Okay, hopefully 
everyone can hear me. Um, thank you so much for everyone to, um, for joining in today and thanks to APU and Injury Matters for having uh, Kids Safe WA a part of today's session. Um, so as APU said, my name is Kristen. I'm a Senior Project Officer at Kids Safe WA. Um, thank you to APU for the acknowledgement of country. I would also like to pay my respects to the traditional custodians of the land uh, here in West Leaderville, the Wajak Noongar people, and also extend um, that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are listening in today. Um, so as I mentioned, we are talking about each related injury amongst young children. Um, so the Kids Safe WA part of this webinar will focus on exer exertional heat illness, as we mostly see this type of injury associated with um, kids participating in physical activity in those hotter temperatures. So with global climate change and the slow rise in ambient temperatures, we just want to make sure that we're aware of the risks and how to uh, know how we can recognise and treat heat illness um, when it does happen for those vulnerable, vulnerable populations. Um, so just a bit of an overview, we'll start by um, giving you a quick introduction to Kids Safe WA and what we do, um, what heat exertional heat illness is, the risk factors, prevention strategies, signs and symptoms, and the management of exertional heat illness. Um, we'll quickly touch on some further resources and also finish up by looking at um, heat-related illness associated with um, leaving children in hot cars. So for those who are hearing about Kids Safe WA for the very first time today, we are a leading non-profit organisation dedicated to promoting safety and preventing childhood accidents and injuries in WA. Um, sadly, we know that more children die from injury than from cancer, asthma and infectious diseases combined. So we work across the Western Australian community to educate and inform parents, uh, carers, professionals, and children themselves on keeping them safe at home, uh, on the road, and at play as well. Um, and in 2020, we celebrated our 40th anniversary of Kids Safe being in WA, which is a um, big achievement for us. So across Western Australia, we know that 24 children die each year from a preventable injury. Over, over 8,000, sorry, are hospitalised and around 35,000 children will present to an emergency department for an injury. So at Kids Safe WA, we receive um, injury data from the emergency department at Perth Children's Hospital, which helps to obviously inform our campaign program areas. Um, in terms of heat related injury presentations to PCH, they are relatively low. We only had nine presentations to PCH over a five year period from 2016 to 2021. Um, but it is important to note that if a child was transported to hospital via an ambulance or admitted straight to the trauma or ICU, we wouldn't necessarily see that data. So while the numbers are quite low, we know that the outcome of heat, heat stroke is quite life-threatening to a small child um, and just something that we should all be aware of, um, especially for professionals that are working with children um, in those situations. So throughout this um, presentation, we are referring to exertional heat illness and injury not because of illness or medical condition. So exertional heat illness refers to a range of medical conditions that occur when the body's core temperature rises during physical activity in warm to hot weather. So for children at risk of heat illness, we're looking at those situations where they're engaging in physical activity in those high temperatures. So sport during school hours, weekend community sports, um, just young kids playing outside and running around in those higher temperatures in those sorts of situations. So we know there are four types of exertional heat illness, which may which do vary in severity. So obviously our first one being heat stroke, being the most life-threatening form, uh, heat exhaustion, heat syncope, which is fainting, and muscle cramps being the least serious type of heat illness. Um, so heat stroke occurs when the core body temperature rises above 40 degrees and the body begins to shut down. So when the body's temperature rises to this level, multiple organs suffer damage and it's vital that the body temperature is reduced as quickly as we can. Um, it's important to note that it can be very difficult to tell the difference between an individual who is suffering from heat exhaustion and heat stroke. Um, and because of this, we recommend that anyone who is suspected of suffering from heat illness is managed as a worst case scenario and aggressively cooled um, in case it is heat stroke. So it's obviously important for professionals who are working with kids in these settings just to be aware of the risk factors and just know how to treat a child um, in that worst case scenario. So looking at the risk factors for heat-related illness and injury, there are three broad categories of risk factors, including physical, psychological, and environmental. Um, the degree of influence that each category has um, does vary, and it is important to acknowledge that they all can be interrelated um, in different settings. So 
firstly, looking at physical, <coughs> uh, we know that children are at higher risk of exertional heat illness in comparison to adults. Uh, they tend to be less fit and acclimatised to climatic conditions and obviously increases their risk of developing a heat illness. Um, we also know that children with a higher percentage of body fat may also be at greater risk of being affected by the heat. Um, children tend to sweat less than adults, meaning that they're not cooling down and reducing their body temperature as well as we can. And especially for teenagers who are experiencing growth spurts or might be increasing their training capacity, they are also at an increased risk. So obviously they have such periods of rapid growth as going through um, their teenage years. There's so much happening within their bodies that even if they are a highly trained teen in a specialised sport, they are also still at an increased risk of um, heat illness. So um, psychological um, risk factors, um, children don't have the same level of awareness that we have about overheating and becoming too warm, especially young children. Um, they often re are relying on others to regulate their environment for them. So their parents, carers, childcare educators, teachers, all those people around them that are caring for them in that young age group. Um, and this regulation can include things like making sure that they're stopping when they are physically exercising or playing sports, um, and just making sure they are uh, consuming enough water as they go through um, that activity. Um, lastly, we have environmental risk factors. So we know that rising air temperature and relative humidity is a major risk factor here for heat illness. Humidity levels have a significant impact on someone's ability to regulate their body temperature. So when we do have higher levels of humidity, there is a decrease in sweat evaporation, which just makes it harder for the body to cool itself down. Um, and then we also have the playing surface that children are using and the time of day that they're engaging in that physical activity. Um, so, sorry, I'm just going to move this away. So firstly, looking at our playing surface. So it's probably not too surprising that the most um, high risk surface for heat related injury is asphalt. This obviously radiates back high levels of heat for children that are playing on those surfaces. surfaces. Um, so this might be in a school setting, we might have those older style basketball courts or just areas around the school where they are engaging in that physical activity. Um, in this setting, it's important to monitor how much time children are spending outdoors playing on these types of surfaces in those hotter weather conditions. Um, we then have synthetic turf, which presents a lower risk than asphalt, but it does also produce a greater level of surface heat compared to natural grass. Um, we look at timber boards, um, sand, and obviously our natural grass, which is well irrigated, uh, green natural grass. And then lastly, we have water for water-based sports. This is um, obviously the lowest risk of uh, low, lowest risk surface in terms of heat emission, um, but we obviously know that water can reflect uh, UV rays, and it's important to consider those um, sun protection um, safety measures as well. We then have the time of day. So lastly, um, we are looking at what time of day children are outdoors play, engaging in this physical activity, which is obviously an important environmental consideration. So ideally, we want children to avoid playing um, and engaging in physical activity during the hottest parts of the day, which we know in Australia is between 11 and 3. Um, we completely understand that in a school setting, this is not always an option because we have such a limited amount of time with kids being out of school. It's hard to stick to um, avoiding those hot parts of the day. If kids are outdoors during that time of the day, we just need to make sure we're taking those steps to manage the risk, making sure they're regularly stopping for water breaks and they aren't playing for extended periods of time out there. Um, when children are playing or engaging in physical activity in those higher temperatures, the risk of heat illness become, starts to rise within about 30 minutes of engaging in the activity. So just being aware of this if we do have kids playing outdoors in those hotter months that we head into. So just looking at a few ways that we can prevent these types of injuries and reduce the risk of exertional heat illness in children. So as we just discussed, those environmental uh, risk factors are a major contributor to heat illness. Um, first is looking at environmental prevention strategies, um, heat cascades. So a top-down heat cascade refers to this excess heat load at the landscape level that's then transferred to a building level and then finally to an individual. So when we consider an increase in ambient air temperatures outside because of global warming, we start, need to start thinking about the steps that we can take to reduce the impact of those environmental risk factors. So in a school, childcare or sporting venue sort of environment, um, we could be looking at the types of building materials that we're using that are going to reflect heat back into the environment, um, trying to introduce vegetation where possible, having that natural grass surfacing or those asphalt surfacing, um, and also looking at internal environments that, aren't, that are going to reduce the cumulative heat load 
experienced by a group of children. So once they have finished their physical activity or sports, bringing them back into an air conditioned classroom, having air conditioned locker rooms or, or internal placement playrooms in um, childcare centres. Um, so looking at the individual prevention strategies that we can implement, Firstly, looking at cold fluids. We know that drinking cold fluids and ice slushies before physical activity helps to maintain a cool internal body temperature, um, but keeping in mind that ingesting those cold fluids and slushies during the activity is actually less effective for cooling the body. So just making sure that we're getting those cold drinks before kids are engaging in the sport or physical activity. Um, water dousting, so this involves wetting the skin with sponges or towels soaked in cold water or spraying the, the skin with cold water from a spray bottle. Um, also helps to increase evapora evaporation and is probably the most effective cooling mechanism in those hot conditions. Misting fans, outdoor fans with an inbuilt misting system are really effective at helping to cool body temperature. It is worth noting that just a normal fan without the misting feature isn't as effective as cooling someone down um, once the air temperature goes past 39 degrees. So if we do have kids that are playing in that really, really extreme temperatures. Um, just having a misting fan, if it is an option for you, is a good idea um, just to get them to um, be cooled down. Um, submerging uh, arms and feet in water, and lastly, ice packs and towels. So placing an ice pack wrapped in a damp cloth or a damp towel filled with crushed ice just around their neck to help them cool down at neighbouring temperature. So as professionals working with children in these sporting and play settings, it's important that we know the signs and symptoms of exertional heat illness so that we can act quickly to cool that child down. So some of the common symptoms that we see are lightheadedness, heat sink, which is fainting, uh, dizziness, vomiting, nausea, obvious fatigue, loss of skill and coordination, unsteadiness, cessation of sweating, confusion, aggressive or irrational behaviour, collapse or ashen grey pale skin. So if a child is experiencing that dizziness, fainting, headache or vomiting, it's often because of a sudden drop in their blood pressure as their blood is now flowing to the skin and away from their major organs. So if we do start to see these signs and symptoms appearing in a child, we obviously want to um, act uh, immediately. Um, so it's important that we know how to help a child out in this situation so it doesn't progress to become um, heat stroke and their life from, uh, being in danger. So the goal of first aid for heat related illness is to reduce the individual's body temperature as quickly as possible. And there are several ways that we can do this. It just depends on what resources are available to you at the time. Obviously in some settings, we might not have a lot of resources available, but if we know we're going to be in a situation with kids exercising or, or engaging in sports in these high temperatures, we can make sure we have the resources ready if we do need them um, for this situation. So we'll just touch on these three um, different types of um, these different management systems. So firstly, looking at the strip soak fan strategy. So this is um, a highly effective method for cooling an individual and it can be achieved with very minimal resources if we are out, are out there with um, not too much to help us. So firstly, making sure the child stops the activity as soon as they can, moving them to a cool environment and laying them down, preferably an air conditioned room, but often we don't have access to these types of um, settings so just making sure we're putting the child in a, in a well ventilated shaded area which is obviously going to be better than um, keeping them out in the sun trying to treat them out there. Um, removing the outer clothing to cool down their body including any wet clothing and just misting the skin with cool water. Um, you can also place towels over their skin that have been soaked in cold water. If you are using wet towels just making sure that we're regularly taking them off pulling the towel down again before putting them back on the child. Um, if you do have access to ice, you can make a bit of an ice slushy with ice and water in a bucket. And that's a really effective way to cool down the towels quickly and moving back onto the child to cool them down. Um, fanning the child with whatever is available to you. If you have a pedestal fan there, excellent. If not, a flipboard, a bin lid, anything that's going to be able to fan um, air onto that child. Closely monitoring the child and if, if they're not responding to cooling methods, call into your if necessary and preparing to give CPR as they can get into this stage quite quickly if the call is not working. Um, next, we have the immersion strategy. So again, the same steps at the start, stopping the activity immediately, moving the person to a cool environment and removing the outer clothing. Immerse as much of the individual in cold water as possible and do not leave them alone. Obviously, if we have access to a big tub or we've got cold water in there and we have a child in there, if there's a risk that they are suffering heat illness, and they can potentially become unconscious. We definitely don't want to leave them alone in there. So just staying nearby um, while we monitor them. Um, if we don't have a tub or a large enough 
um, source of water to put them in, or we can immerse their feet or their ankle, uh, feet up to their ankles in cold water as well. Um, if we are doing this method with just their feet up to their ankles, just making sure we're also trying to pull down the rest of their body with those cold towels um, that we mentioned before. Um, again, closely monitor cold triple zero if necessary and implemented with CPR. Our last management strategy is ice packs. So again, those same steps at the start, stop the activity, move the person to a cool environment, remove out of clothing and mist the skin. Then we can place ice packs wrapped in a damp towel underneath the armpit, on the groin and on the chest. It is important to um, wrap those ice packs in damp towels, just helps to conduct the cold from the ice pack to the skin and it also prevents any ice burn on the skin. Um, fan the child with whatever is available to you, closely monitor them, or for zero if necessary and prepare to give CPR. So obviously with each of these management strategies, we just want to be continually trying to cool down the child until their skin feels cool to touch and they show signs of improvement. It's important to stop any cooling processes if they start to shiver or their skin does feel really cold to touch. If we have a child that starts to vomit or doesn't respond to any cooling methods, getting them to that medical help um, as soon as we can and call it triple zero if necessary. So going forward, we want to know how to recognize and manage heat illness, obviously, but it would be great if we could prevent this happening in the first place. So a way to do that is looking at um, heat policies and procedures we can put in place to prevent heat illness from happening in the first place. So depending on the context of your role in your organization, it may be appropriate to develop and implement a policy or a guideline on how to manage and mitigate this risk if we have kids um, exercising or engaging in sports in these hotter temperatures. Um, there are a number of resources available to help develop a policy or guideline, um, which do come from a range of reputable agencies. So these include the Sports Medicine Australia Extreme Heat Policy, um, the Vic Sport Hot Weather Guidelines for Sport and Active Recreation, and also the Sun Smart Shade Guidelines. Um, if you would like more information on implementing a policy in your organisation, whether it be in a school, childcare setting, a sporting association, you can reach out to these organisations for more information or just get in touch with us if you WA um, and we can connect you to the relevant uh, contacts going forward. Some additional resources that might be helpful for you in your role, we have the Bureau of Meteorolo Meteorology uh, website and they also have an app that they've released, obviously giving us up-to-date weather forecasts. Uh, the Thermal Comfort Observations, which is available on the BOM website as well. A lot of those heat policies that I just mentioned um, do refer to Thermal Comfort Observations and they will go into um, to explaining what they, those observations are and how to use them um, in terms of predicting um, the weather going forward. And lastly, the Heat Wave Service of Australia. So just um, giving this warning if we are expecting a heat wave, we can obviously put a hold on any sports that might be going ahead in that heat wave. Um, so these can all be helpful if you're involved in children's weekend community sports, even as a parent outside of your work role. Um, if you are in a work role as a teacher or as part of a sporting carnival, any situation where we have kids playing in those um, hotter temperatures. Uh, we obviously know that summer uh, temperatures are on the rise and it's, it's so vital that we take these steps um, and we reduce the risk of this type of injury where we can. So just before I hand over to Bruce, I'll quickly touch on another setting where children are exposed to those extreme temperatures and are at risk of heat related illness, which is when children are left unattended in hot cars. So obviously this is a little bit different to the exertional heat illness that we just spoke about, but it is another type of injury that will inevitably be impacted by the rise of ambient, ambient temperatures that are caused by climate change. Um, this is something that we try to raise awareness of all throughout the year, but particularly this time of year, as we head into the warm, warmer months. Um, so children can be in, intentionally or unintentionally left in hot cars, and they can also be accidentally locked inside of the car. Um, we know that every year approximately 5,000 Australian children are rescued from parked cars, with about three quarters of those children being under four years of age. So even on a cool day, the temperature inside of a parked car can reach up to 30 degrees hotter than the outside temperature, and that increase starts to happen within about five minutes of the car door being closed. So it happens very, very quickly, even on a day like today, that temperature is going to rise um, very rapidly. Um, similarly to other heat related illnesses, we know that kids are more at risk in this situation if they are left in a parked car. Um, they're a lot more susceptible to heat stress in those circumstances and especially for younger children, they don't often show those signs of distress that we might show if we were in that situation. Um, obviously with the Australian climate that we have being quite harsh, it's not uncommon for those summer temperatures to reach the high 30s and for a child that's left unattended in a car in those temperatures, the risk of death is extremely high and it does happen very, very quickly. 
So at Kids Safe WA, we currently have a Do Not Leave Children in Cars campaign. Uh, essentially, this campaign aims to raise community awareness of the dangers of leaving kids in the car and just acts as a reminder for parents and carers. So as part of the campaign, um, we have produced these signs that can be purchased by organisations to be installed in their car parks. Um, they're ideally fitted for anyone that has parents parking in their car parks, local governments, playground car parks, rec centres, community centres, swimming pools and beach car parks, um, shopping complexes and even schools as well. So these signs um, do include the organisation logo at the bottom right there and they're just a nice simple reminder for community members to always take their kids with them every time they are leaving the car. Um, the signs range from $62 to $70 per sign, just depending on the number of signs being ordered and they can be purchased through our Kids FWA website. Um, so just lastly, a few additional resources on this topic. We have our Kids FWA website and the campaign page there, um, which Afri will send you the slides later on, so you can click that link. Um, RAC, they, offer, they release regular media statements on the number of children and pets that they're rescuing every year and just giving some tips on what to do if you ever came across a child unattended in a car. Um, and lastly, there's a link there to the Unconventional Oven Campaign by Kids Safe Australia and Amy. So this um, link links to a really great video um, featuring the chef Matt Moran, and it just shows that he can cook a piece of meat by leaving it in a car on a hot day and just brings awareness to the dangers of leaving a child um, in a car unattended. So please have a look at those if you are interested for more information on that um, area. That is everything for me. I hope you found the information useful today um, in your roles. If you'd like to chat with us further about any of the content presented, um, please get in touch with us. We'd be more than happy to talk to you. Um, you can email me at kristen at kidsafewa.com.au or call our West Leadership Centre on 644-4887. Um, but thanks very much. I'll now hand back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen, that was amazing. Um, I'll hand it over to Ruth now from the Department of Fire and Emergency Services, WA. Um, Ruth is a injury, sorry, I do have a slide for this. I will share that, just give me two seconds. Um, so Ruth is, oh, no. <laughs> Ruth is a Prevention and Safety Program Coordinator at the Department of Fire and Emergency Services, and she'll be talking about um, the um, juvenile, oh God. Uh, give me two secs. Um, Ruth uh, looks after the Jaffa program, among um, other programs at the Department of Fire and Emergency Services. And the Jaffa program stands for Juvenile and Fire Family Fire Awareness Program. Um, so please welcome Ruth. I will stop sharing for you to share your screen. Okay, I'll just get to. No, it's not sitting there. Just one moment. The wonders of technology. And it works always before you need it and then not when you need it. So no, it is not working. Just Are you able to share screen? Yes, but it's not allowing me, it's not giving me um, my, hang on, let's go files. No, it's not giving me any options. Um, Just bear with me. Just reopen it and see how we go. Okay. Yep, that's working. Um, let me go back. 
All right. Sorry about that. Starting to get a bit panicky. So thank you very much for, um, for the opportunity to come and talk today. I also wish to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land in which we meet, the Wujak people of the Noongar Nation. Sorry, and Ruth, we can see your notes. You can? Yeah. Yeah, all right, let's. I present a view then. And yeah, so I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which we we, where I am talking to you from today and to acknowledge and respect their ongoing contribution um, and their leaders past, emerging and present. I work, I work for the Department of Fire and Emergency Services, which is the hazard management authority for a range of natural disasters and emergency incidents. We have a variety of programs to engage the community in um, a range of hazards, but um, namely bushfire, structure fire, cyclone, flood and storm safety. My particular uh, role within DFES is to coordinate the Juvenile and Family Fire Awareness Program, which I will talk a little bit about today, but also to work in prevention around bushfire and um, home fire safety. So I, I, I work very much in the space of prevention um, with those two hazards. Um, so, I'm going to talk predominantly today about young people and fire and move quickly into, well, move halfway through that this presentation into talking about intervention with young people and fire and how to manage that. Um, I guess when we're, we're talking about young people and fire, the first question is, is why do young people start fires? And um, for the vast majority of young people involved in fire, they actually have little or no understanding of fire behaviour and the consequences of, of playing with fire. And depending on their age, the child actually may not know better. So what we've found through our own, um, I mean, this, this graph is a representation of the young people that we've seen over a 10 year period. So the vast majority are involved in some sort of fire play um, because of peer pressure, curiosity and boredom. So it's, it's the curiosity is, is, you know, what will happen if I do this? Um, not, you know, not malicious, antisocial behaviour or attention seeking, which most people would, would jump to the conclusion of. Fundamentally, when we talk about children knowing better, if we think about what education young people have in the space of fire. Most fire safety education programs carry plenty of fire survival messages. So what to do if there is a fire. So crawl low under smoke, stop, drop, cover and roll if you've got flame on you. But very few of them um, focus on fire prevention. So not playing with matches and lighters in the first place and for parents making sure that matches and lighters are not, are treated with the same respect as poisons and that they're kept out of young people's reach and preferably in a locked cupboard. Um, and so when we talk about that they should know better, they, what, I, what I have found in my many years of working with young people is that most of them do not know how fire behaves and they do not understand that a small ignition becomes quite large, like a small flicker of a flame can become a large fire in no time at all. So, um, they don't actually know better and it's it's incumbent on us as adults working with young people to spend some time explaining to them about fire. Um, more than three quarters of the young people that we see light fires in the company of their peers, even if it isn't their primary motivating factor. And that the, typically the child who lights, plays with lighters and matches is one that has too much time with little supervision. So they have, um, don't have many other uh, things that they enjoy to do, like they don't have hobbies or, and they have lots of time on their own hand where they're, you know, where they're not supervised. Um, so whilst a child of any age can be involved in lighting fires, what we find is, is it's most common in adolescents, which makes sense because with the coming of adolescents, as parents, we supervise them less and they and peer influence is it's at its greatest in, 
adolescents. They listen less to their parents and more to their friends. So generally speaking, um, there are three uh, widely accepted developmental phases of fire. I'll briefly just touch on these. These phases, they, these phases broadly reflect the severity of, of the behaviour, so an increasing risk to themselves and the developmental changes with age. So most children will show an interest in fire, from fire trucks to firefighters from age of around two years old. Colourful lighters um, add to that curiosity. Generally speaking, um, the movement into fire starting and fire play actually is really um, comes with access. So if you've got a three-year-old or a two-year-old who can find a lighter and start it, then they will because that curiosity will lead them into, into play. Um, most children will have one unsupervised fire play in their time. I mean, if you ask a room of even firefighters or any adult, have you ever played with lighters and matches when you were kids? And they would say yes, and they would be able to recall a story where they played with candles, they played with wax, or they played with lighters um, outside. So it's not uncommon. But the problem is, is without clear information about the consequences of fire, those actions where they explore fire and ignition items without adult supervision and their, um, and their curiosity turns into experimentation, then what happens is, is that a negative experience can happen and it happens very, very commonly. Um, what we find is that children um, without a negative experience, so when we'll continue to play and be curious around fire, and that might be simply as playing with candles and flicking a lighter or burning leaves, like I've said. But as they um, experiment more, they can lead into far more dangerous behaviours and there is no shortage of supply of um, brilliant ideas on how to use fire on um, YouTube and now TikTok. So um, if as an adult you have not yet explored TikTok and explored the terms fire in TikTok, then you are living life compared to children because they can see all sorts of what um, we would call stupid things with fire, but they think are amazing and great fun because they're explosive. Without that link between cause and effect, um, it's, it can be really dangerous. And what we find then is that children become really cocky uh, very overly confident um, and unresponsible to parental intervention because they feel that they can control fire sources and they see people um, on TikTok, YouTube and other social media formats um, doing, doing that kind of behaviour. Fire setting is really the next step up. So fire setting is repeated planned fire starting. Um, with ignition sources collected and this or stolen and their materials purposely flammable. So this is where you start, when kids start moving from fire starting into fire setting, it means they've gone from, oh, here's a lighter that mum and dad have left around or they're found on the street into, I'm going to go purposely look for it and I'm going to look up TikTok and I'm going to see what the latest thing is doing. So that is that movement into fire setting. Within fire setting, there are also degrees of fire setting and fire setting is, is the behaviour that most would, would most concern us is because it's repeated, um, you know, it's not a one-off incident, it's repeated and, and they often usually do it on their own. So this is the kids there where there isn't a peer influence anymore is very concerning. And they fit into quite a few different formats of, of, of or different ways to describe. So we have our emotional fire setting. So the young person who has an argument with a friend or with family, or there's emotional upheaval in their in their life, 
and they have difficulty regulating those emotions so they will use light the light fires to express their feelings so quite commonly that would would look like i've had an argument with mum i go down to the local park i'm sitting there with my lighter and i set fire to some leaves and or i set fire or i, I start flicking my lighter on the play equipment and then not realizing that it's going to take off quite quickly and melt the whole of the structure and young people who like those kind of fires almost always express remorse and their intent is never to cause damage. The next lot is our delinquent fire setters, so our antisocial ones where they're looking to um, cover a crime. Um, they almost always intend to cause damage and they rarely, if ever, choose to uh, ever have remorse. Um, and then the next one is our um, grievance, the one who's angry with someone. So they'll set fire to something, or they'll set fire to someone's bag or they'll set fire to uh, something of worth to someone like their sister's t-shirt because they're really angry. And um, then lastly, there's the pathological fire setter, which is related to a raft of mental health um, or personality disorders uh, or behavioural problems that they have. And these fires are almost always concealed, destructive and planned. Pathological fire setters are rare especially in young people, um, very rarely in teenagers, mostly in adults, and they have a long history of family dysfunction. So that's kind of like the developmental phase. And the majority of young people sit in the um, fire play part of that, or as bystanders, they'll be curious. So they'll stay in and hang around with their friends who are lighting fires because they're curious. Um, and they won't intervene. And then you've got the people who are fire starting, fire play, and more complex other fire setters. So this kind of gives broadly um, the, where we would we sit down and try and think about where a young person is. So um, this makes sense in the context of when we give a fire safety education program to young people where there's psychosocial intervention, where we're trying to figure out where they sit in this, because depending where they sit will depend on what level of intervention is required and what kind of information is needed for the young person. But you can see that um, from the fire starting through to pathological fire setting, there are quite a lot of difference. And where um, the majority of fires happen for very young children is in the fire starting section and it's unplanned. So if you don't have your lighters and if adults don't have lighters and matches lying around for children, it is very unlikely that they will light fires at all. These are our risk factors for fire setting, for, um, which are pretty much the same risk factors for most antisocial behaviours that young people are involved in. So fire setting would be just yet yeah, another would be broadly spoken as antisocial, even though um, their behaviour may not be purposely delinquent. So being careful to differentiate there. Um, in terms of that. Um, Children with three or more risk factors are particularly at high risk of, of persistent fire setting. So um, the first one being male, we would see for every, every one female, we would see nine males. So we see a lot more boys than we do girls. That has changed in the last couple of years. So this is predominantly over like the last these figures are based on the last 10 years, but in the last couple of years, we've seen a lot more girls who um, are involved and more often than not, they will, in terms of fire setting, they sit in the emotion, uh, emotional dysregulation so they're, or in the antisocial behaviour where they're in a, uh, in a group of people and they're um, stealing stuff and setting fire to it. So that's where they mostly sit. But if they have more than, if they have more than three of these risk factors, um, then that yeah they're at high risk of persistent fire setting and they need more than a fire safety education session. So that kind of leads me into the two intervention approaches that are available worldwide. Um, so for the people who are you know uh, watching this webinar from overseas, 
There are fire safety education programs throughout the world that are very similar to the one that DFES offers. Um, they're offered by either um, trained professionals uh, or teachers who are, who are tra trained in fire behaviour or most predominantly through fire services. So if you're in another part of the world and you have young people who are showing fire setting behaviour or even fire starting behaviour, then getting in touch with your local fire service would be your first point in terms of fire safety education to see what's available. The second approach is psychosocial intervention from our child and adolescent health service or private specialists. Um, patholo whilst we would be referred pathological fire setters, we would often suggest that they would be more appropriately seen by someone who has um, specialist psycho or, or social psychosocial training, behavioural training to support that young person and their family or addiction training, um, wherever that, that fits. So that kind of leads me into the program that I coordinate. So the Juvenile and Family Fire Awareness Program is a free confidential fire safety program delivered by specially trained firefighters across, across WA. There is a version of Jaffa in almost every state and territory of, of Australia called Different Things. Um, we run our program for six to six, children six to 16 years. Although we wouldn't turn away someone younger, um, our focus would then be probably with parents because three, four, five year olds with act access to admission sources. Our program materials are fundamentally based at, you know, at different um, levels of, of um, children through to pre-adolescence and then through to adolescence. So again, we do off, uh, do often accept children five years or younger, but the focus would be very heavily working with parents to reduce their access to admission sources. Our overall aim is to reduce property loss, injury and loss of life as a result of deliberately lit fires. Um, there are, I mean, in last year alone, there were 1,244 structure fires and over 3,500 bushfires of which about 80% of those bushfires were deliberately lit. So um, it has a huge impost on our community, huge cost in terms of response to that, and the loss of life um, and injury and loss of property has um, huge impacts on our community that I don't, I don't think I need to explain further than that. Um, JAFO is designed for families where parental intervention has been ineffective, where a parent really needs the support of an expert to get the message through. So in terms of fire safety education, what we know works is a, um, I mean, this, this diagram shows us an approach that, that it, based on international research shows us that we work. That work. So we identify young people who show unsafe fire behaviour, that's through referral. We perform a needs assessment, so we ask a range of questions which are particularly targeted at understanding what level in that developmental phase they're at and how they, what information they know, or, you know, what's their baseline of fire safety information that they have. We then provide a quality fire safety education program that's targeted to their age and maturity and their involvement in fire. And then we link to other services as required and conduct follow up to track results. So we check in at six weeks and six months. And if a young person is still persisting at six months, we'll check in again at 12 months. Our approach in terms of education is um, four to seven years, stay away from fire. Uh, basically, at, at this age, there is no safe, unsupervised use of fire. Um, that age range, that no, no child can safely use fire without being supervised, and even then, shouldn't be directly um, involved in flame and playing with flame. It should be very much the focus of that education is that fire is a tool, it is not a toy. Um, so even in terms of birthday cakes and we you know, fine to blow it out once, but parents out there, if you're lighting that fire so they can blow it out five times, you're making it into a game. And so therefore fire is a toy. And that, you know, that message goes directly against what um, we would encourage. 
eight to 11 years, the focus is on safe versus unsafe fire with the understanding that any unsupervised use of fire by a young person is unsafe. So again, we're needing to role model safe use of fire. For 12 to 16 year olds, the focus is on fire science and fire development and the factors that affect fire um, and the spread of fire and what if scenarios, so burn injuries, explosive nature of aerosols and legal consequences. Not hard and fast, we have some very savvy nine and 10 year olds who would be given some really good fire science. And we have some immature 12 and 13, 14 year olds who would need to have very much a focus on safe versus unsafe fire. And these are some of the resources that we use in terms of that education. Um, one of the things I missed out saying was that for each and every age group we cover uh, some level of fire behaviour of how quickly it can spread um, so that there's an understanding that small ignitions become really big fire, fire, flaming fires very quickly and the consequences fire with um, the messaging appropriate for each of those age groups. So the photos on the bottom we would use frequently with all age groups, whereas the photos that are up on the top corner we would use very rarely with younger age groups and would be very much more designed for your 10 plus age group where they're looking at the um, explosive nature of fires and burn injuries. Um, and I should have probably given a content warning for that photo, but it is actually the least gruesome picture that we have in terms of burn injury because they are, burn injuries are a lifelong injury with huge impacts. And that's probably the key message for most age groups is that once you have a burn injury that is partial or full thickness, then it is a lifelong injury um, that you need to work with. So that is me. Okay, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them. Thank you, Ruth. Yes, we have actually had one come through. So I think that this was for you. Um, it was, do you do education in schools and is there a cost? So DFES does run a home fire safety program for students in year school. It's designed for year three students and is free of charge. So it, and year two students, if um, schools would prefer it within their curriculum. We also offer um, that Aaron's Promise Big Book that um, that, I, that Aaron's Promise book, we provided a big book version of that to every childcare centre and primary school in July last year during COVID when we were unable to do school visits. Um, and that comes in a big, as I said, a big book version of it, so like A3 size. And we have, uh, we encourage schools to contact fire stations if they would like a firefighter to deliver that story to their young people in conjunction and those two are free of charge so that you know childcare centers are free to ask us but what we find is is that's most suited for um four to six year olds so we're looking at kindergarten pre-primary year one is that that book is most a firefighter's ability to deliver that program it's not really what's most beneficial for kids, but also our firefighters' ability to engage a group of young people who probably sits better in that kindergarten, pre-primary, year one age group. We do some work in bushfire, um, and but all of our programs are free of charge. So if they want to contact me or contact um, community preparedness at DFES um, in the same email address, uh, we'll accept community preparedness at the front. They're more than welcome to contact me for terms of school programs. Thank you so much, Ruth. Um, if anyone has any other questions, please pop them in the Q&A box. I might start sharing my screen now. Um, Thank you, Ruth. That was um, a great uh, presentation on the Jaffa program. Um, oh, we might have another question. Oh no, that was just you. <laughs> um, yeah. All right, I might. Uh, 
move on to some upcoming trainings that Injury Matters has. Um, so at Injury Matters, we have a number of um, trainings for health professionals that we um, facilitate and um, have planned for the rest of the year and the start of next year. So we have the Stand Your Feet um, program's 20th birthday event coming up tomorrow. So we have, that's 20 years of the Stand Your Feet program. Um, uh, we also have the Australian New Zealand Falls Prevention Conference, which is happening in early December from the 1st to the 3rd. But before that, if you're working in the Falls Prevention space, we have a pre-conference event um, on the 30th of November, and it's a networking event. So if anyone is interested to come along for that one, uh, you can sign up or express interest on our website. We also have our next webinar focusing on disability and how we can make homes and workplaces safer for people with disability. And that is planned for the 6th of December around International Day of People with Disability. So if you're interested in any of the ones on the screen, any of the trainings that are coming up, um, feel free to go onto our website in the events tab and register for any of them. So um, keep the conversation going from today. Um, please join the Injury Prevention Network. Um, the Injury Prevention Network meets quarterly to provide professionals such as yourselves working in the injury prevention space across WA with an opportunity to connect with each other, to share learnings and solutions in injury prevention and safety promotion. If you want to sign up um, and be a part of the network, let me know or send me an email using the, my email address, um, akarajagi at injurymatters.com. Uh, .org.au, sorry. Um, also, for evaluation, we'd love to hear your feedback about what you thought about today's workshop training. Um, so if you, um, as the webinar ends, um, a evaluation survey is going to pop up on your screen. Um, we would appreciate if you could complete the survey so we know what you thought about today's webinar. We really value your feedback and it helps us to ensure we're delivering trainings that meet your needs. Sorry, Kristen, this is your uh, image, but um, register to Connected. So Connected is an online networking program for professionals working in the injury prevention space. It is a networking program where participants are randomly paired bi-monthly to have a 15 minute conversation with another professional working in the injury prevention injury prevention space. Um, Connected takes the hassle out of networking and provides you with the opportunity to connect and share your knowledge and skills um, within the injury prevention sector. Um, so yeah, this is lovely. Michelle Lambert and Kristen Jamieson um, chatting over some coffee um, and they found the program useful. So um, yeah, please register using the scan the QR code on the screen there or um, um, hop on on our website uh, and click the link that pops up that to register. So that is it for today. For today. Thank you, Kristen uh, from KidSafe and Roots from Department of Fire and Emergency Services. Um, it was a lovely um, educative webinar and um, I hope um, you guys learned something today. Thank you. Thank you very much.